Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. For decades, the terrain of liberal theorizing, that is the terrain of conversations among academic philosophers about the principles of a free society or a liberal democratic society, for many decades, the terrain of that theorizing has lain in a deep freeze. Um, and that divide among the philosophers between these two camps that I'll describe mirrors a divide in our, in our politics between parties of left and parties of right. It's not that the parties of left and right have no middle ground, nothing in common. It's that when each side looks, tries to point out their ideal, their ideal form for the best society, they point in very different directions. And the reason they point in different directions, I think, is because of the very different ways they think about the philosophical ideas that underlie a free society. Beneath each of these two camps is a, is a fundamentally different understanding of what the nature of a person is that we should begin with when we start building up arguments about politics. So by libertarians, I mean people like, um, well, Ayn Rand in the popular, uh, popular mind, um, R Murray Rothbard. By classical liberals, I mean people like Adam Smith, I suppose, is their, their forebearer. But people like Frederick Hayek is probably the most prominent one. Um, many others I could add. But from this, in this camp, they begin politics, at least the libertarian ones do, like Rand and Rothbard, with the idea that the person, that what a person is, is a self-owner. Right? This is the idea from John Locke. That they are, and they see themselves as the true heirs of John Locke. And on this conception of politics, well, how do we start thinking about how we should live together? How do we start thinking about the role the state is? They say, well, imagine a person in a state of nature. What do we know about a person when there's no state? And they focus on this naturalistic question about what we're really like in the state of nature, morally speaking. And Locke had this idea that we all are, by, our, by nature, free and equal children of God, each of whom owns ourself. Since we own ourselves, Locke famously argued, we own our labor too. Since we own our labor, we can mix our labor with things in the world and come to acquire property rights in those things. When we, since we own those things through, through nature, property has arrived in, in a natural way, when the time comes to ask ourselves, well, what should the state be? What should the state do? A primary thing the state should do on that way of reasoning is protect those God-given property rights. Because people are self-owners, and that's where politics should begin, we get a conception of politics which puts very great weight on economic liberty, on those private property rights. And it sees any state attempt to move property around for any purposes as a violation of self-ownership. It's taking a person who's a self-owner and making that person into a slave for someone else. It's taking that person's labor and their ambitions and their successes and making it transfer it to somebody else illegitimately, wrongly, a violation of their rights. On the other side is the camp of the, the high liberals. And the high liberals begin someplace very differently. If the libertarians are the heirs of Locke, the high liberals are the heirs, I suppose, of of, of Rousseau. And their idea is when we ask ourselves what are, how should we begin our politics, we don't have to go to the state of nature, but rather we ask ourselves, well, what are the moral capacities of people viewed as citizens? That is, if politics is about what we owe each other politically in our role as citizens, rather, th rather than say our role as parents or friends or arch enemies or whatever it might be, if politics is about our role as citizens, they want to know, well, we should start, they say, with a model of what a citizen is. And their idea is that a citizen is a being with these two distinctive characteristics, these two distinctive features. First, a citizen is a person who has a life of her own to lead. So every citizen, is conceived as a citizen, is a being who has, who has, a, who has a, the capacity to set out a plan of life and, and um, that she wants to pursue herself. And that plan of life is important to that person. It is, after all, her
her life. Along with that capacity, the capacity to form a plan of a life, on this, again, on this view, citizens are also conceived as being capable of honoring their fellow citizens, each and every one of them, as also being beings that have a plan of life that they want to pursue, and that they recognize that that plan of life is important for their fellow citizens. So whatever institutional forms we come up, come up with, they should be acceptable to even the least well-off people in society. So that conception of the person, through that kind of reasoning, yields a commitment to something like social justice. That is, a society should be organized in such a way that, along with protecting basic rights that are going to allow people to live their lives, they're also going to be sure that they have this, the institutions are going to work in such a way that no one is left behind, no class is left behind. So you can see that this divide is a deep one. So I work out a view in my book called, that I call free market fairness. And the basic idea, it tries to disrupt the orthodoxy, the, the moral status quo. And the basic idea, my basic idea is that as a person who, for reasons I'll describe in a moment, is really attracted to some of these ideas about the importance, the moral importance to working people, but I'm also really attracted to this. So what I've done, though, in my book, I, as a classical liberal, committed to some of these institutions, I've sort of built an icebreaker that chugs across the frozen divide and then bumps over here and joins the high liberals, but bumps hard into their conception of the democratic citizen. And my idea is to, carrying some insights from, classical liber from the classical liberal camp, though abandoning the foundations, but carrying some of those insights, bump hard into that conception of the citizen in the hope of busting up the ice beneath those igloos so that we, all of us, now fellow democratic citizens, can have a renewed conversation about what it means to be committed to those values. And among the questions I ask are questions like these. Is deliberative democracy really a vehicle that can only make left turns? And most important of all, do we really best respect our fellow citizens as free and equal self-governing authors of their own lives by seeking to limit their private economic liberties? Is that the way we genuinely best respect our fellow citizens? I develop a theory of liberal justice that I call mar market democracy as, the par as sort, of, sort of the framework, and my particular view I call free market fairness, that combines the uncombinables. I have a unity of a de democratic citizen. I ask what we owe one another, viewed that way. And yet, as I see it, the conversation in the past about that question has been conducted by people who, unfortunately, shared a common ideological bias. During the 20th century, the people who developed the idea of social justice had, for reasons I'll describe in a moment, a lot of skepticism about the importance of economic liberty. And when they started, and they were very optimistic about big government programs, thinking that's the only way to get social justice. And so they deliberated together about what these requirements are in a kind of an echo chamber. They didn't have people among them who were really enthusiastic about private everyday, the private virtues of everyday working people, of the bourgeois virtues and the moral importance of some of those bourgeois values. And my thought is to try to add that up, add some things in there, and see where we go, where the conversation goes. And we get, I hope, a combination of economic liberty and social justice, a conception of liberal justice, democratic justice, which I think is morally more attractive than the 20th century conceptions of social justice, which, which deny the importance of economic liberty. So we're trying to decide how we think about justice. Remember, the natural rights people, the Lockeans, said, well, let's think what people are like in a state of nature, and we'll sort of reason out from their natural rights. Here's a different approach. We do it more deliberatively or constructivistly here. We should regard as the most desired order of society, the order that we would choose if we knew that our initial position in it would be determined purely by chance, such as the fact of our being born into a particular family. I just pause for a moment and see the power of that approach. The idea is that we're trying to find a way to model fairness, a commitment to fairness. And so one way to do this is imagine, well, what social world would you live in if you didn't know who you were going to be, where you're going to be stationed in that world. And there's all different kinds of decision strategies you might use in that condition of ignorance. But if you were in sort of, sort of an original position like that, trying to choose what position to live with, with a kind of a, uh, a veil in front of your eyes that made you ignorant of all kinds of important facts, some people think that you would pick a conception of society, pick a, a set of principles 
which emphasized how well the people at the very bottom do. After all, you could be a gambler and think to yourself, well, I want a society that's incredibly unequal because I'm just feeling lucky today and I bet I'm going to be up here. But you're making a choice for the whole, your whole life and a choice for, for the life of all the citizens who are going to live with you. So it might make some sense in this kind of, this kind of choice situation to choose a more, to adopt a more conservative choosing strategy, one which places some special importance on what happens if things go bad and you end up um, at the bottom. For a long time, it was basic part of every liberal conception of justice in the classical tradition that economic liberty should be treated as among the most important basic rights of liberties of people. Libertarians, the more recent group, made property rights into a fetish. They said it's the most important thing by far. And that became the dominant philosophical view. But there was a view for a long time before that Classical liberals, people like Smith and later like Hayek, who thought economic liberties were very important, but only on a par with their other basic rights and liberties. So you can have some taxation to help the poor. Morally, it's fine to do that. You can have some taxation to support schooling if need be. You can have taxation for a whole variety of public purposes. But, these classical liberals recognized, there was important moral weight in private economic liberty. Those choices people make about how to save, how to spend, how to think about one's retirement and what money was going to happen when, when one retires. Those kinds of questions, economic questions, questions about our economic lives, are they force people to think about the relationship between the person they are now, today, and the person that they will be in the future, including in the distant future. John Maynard Keynes, writing in 1930, wrote a brilliant essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren in which he said within 100 years, societies would be eight times wealthier, which is actually roughly true even now. And at that point, Keynes thought, the economic problem would be solved. When it was solved, we would no longer need to grow because those virtues, those bourgeois virtues, are actually vices. We needed them for a while to get to this place of abundance. But once you get to the place of abundance, there's no moral reason to have them anymore. In fact, he thought those virtues wanting your family to do well, telling your kids, come on, get out there, strive, get ahead. All those kinds of things are actually, Keynes says, morbid neuroses. People on the left in the last century, they assumed that as societies became wealthier, people, ordinary people would care less and less about their private economic liberties. But one of the great upsets in political discourse in the last 40, 50 years is that the, op is that some, that the opposite seems to have occurred. And people like Frank Field, a labor minister, have you know, talked about that. What, what does this mean? What does it mean for the Labor Party, for example, that people, as they're getting wealthier, I mean, there's, not, so there's lots of poverty, certainly, but as society generally is getting wealthier, middle class working people seem to continue to resist calls for more taxation. They seem to resist, in many cases, uh, public programs claim to be in their favor. Why is it that people are clinging to their pre-tax income and resisting calls to taxation? Part of it, no doubt, is that they're greedy. But is that, and that's what people, it's comforting to say, well, they're just greedy, they're morally wrong. But maybe that's not right. Maybe morality is also at work in their claims. Maybe they're not just bumping up against morality because they're just greedy people. Maybe, in fact, they're trying to tell the philosopher something, that maybe there's something morally important in their ability to live their lives for themselves, that it's not important just to have material stuff, but it's important, it also matters how one gets to have the material stuff. And to have agency, in one's holdings is morally important. It has some moral weight. And so there are moral reasons within the democratic tradition to assign, to listen to those citizens, and therefore assign some more weight to economic liberty. There's something kind of rather surprising about this book emerging now. I think for most people, the sense would be that free markets and individual freedom and individual choice have kind of failed quite a big test recently. Now, not getting into the whole debate over whether or not it's the banks, the poor, or Bill Clinton who are responsible for, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the problem of subprime mortgages. Right. Isn't it kind of slightly odd to be extolling free markets and the sovereignty of individual choices, as it were, when that stuff just seems to have kind of broken down quite badly? Yes. Not just broken down as a system, but also generated massively wide inequalities. Yes. You know, we can debate about what led to the financial disaster. We can debate about what, caused, what has caused it to go on for so long, that it slowed the recession so much, re, re, slowed the recovery so much in the US, what governmental policies um, have led to this massive inequality, who got what from the bailouts and who was left out. I think 
I, I think I know. I think the government was deeply involved in making that happen. I don't think that had much to do with capitalism at all. But the reason why a lot of UC Tea Party people, and libertarians especially, showing up the Occupy movements in the States is because they sense some kind of a common cause against an enormously corrupt system that hurts working people and people who genuinely care about working people have reason to be very concerned about those bailouts for all kinds of reasons. But more important, um, I think there are sort of macro trends at work that we're seeing, and it's tied to changes in, in the nature of capitalism. You know, a, a lot of the, of the old left conception of hardcore social justice, contempt or diminishment of private economic liberty was built in a different era for a different time. There were different wars back then, different, a different economic situation. In those, in those days, in the, in the early progressive era, to defend private economic liberties, as I call them, would probably be to make workers vulnerable. You leave them all alone out there in the faces of these massive machineries. The economy has changed tremendously since then. And the, ordinary, the, the desire of ordinary workers, the persistent desire of ordinary workers, to have economic liberties, I think, is something that should give us all pause. Daniel Bell, would, in his famous book, Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, yes. makes a massive distinction between production and consumption. Yes. And I'm interested that when you talk about the morality of private economic behavior, you make no distinction between yeah, behavior right. in the productive sphere that's right. and behavior in the, con in, the, in the sphere of consumption. Yes. I, is that because you think there is no distinction? Do you not think that that kind of notion that there is something more edifying about our productive selves than our consuming selves? Uh, my sense is that morally speaking, um, there is moral people find moral value on both sides. So there's moral worth in making these choices for oneself that lead to one's career, that is, liberties of working. Deciding for oneself how many hours you're going to devote to your work life, how many hours you're going to devote to your family and your loved ones. These are the choices that in many ways define who we are. We make those calls every day or through the course of our lives, and we say something about where our values are and what, what kind of people we are. But so too on the consumption side, um, I think people, those, 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 I, I gave some examples when I was speaking, those long-term questions about saving, those long-term uh, worries that when people are exposed to economic risk, or I, as I think of it, enabled to confront them for themselves as, a, as adults, there's an, that's an important realm of liberty too. And I worry that, I, mean, I, 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 I take a lot of insights from, the fe from feminism. There was a feminist critique, especially in the, in the 1800s, that said that providing women with all the gilded material means in the world but denying them economic liberties would still fundamentally treating them as, as, as secondary citizens some way, truncating their autonomy. I think that feminist critique, this will, uh, this will sound bad when I say it, any, say it anyway, that feminist critique can be applied against some of the aspirations of the European social democracies. Wishing the best for people and provide, trying to provide them with the material means in some ways may also limit their liberties, even if people like, even for the people who enjoy um, the gilded cage.